My name is Lee Woodruff, and the book is Those We Love Most. Because of what happened when my husband was injured in Iraq, I sort of became this lightning rod for anybody who ever has a brain injured loved one. So I was in a hotel room ready to go downstairs and give a speech and the phone rang and it was a friend of mine whose son's 17 year old friend had just hit a boy. And he just had been on his way to work and the boy was on his way to school and the boy just sort of rolled off the street and the boy was brain injured in the hospital. The parents wanted to talk to somebody. And I remember saying, okay, I, I have to go deliver this speech and I'll have, have them call me in two hours. They never called. The boy got better. He's doing 100% fine. But I remember walking out of that hotel room going, wow, think about all those lives. It was like throwing a pebble in the water. That kid just happened to be driving down that road at that moment of time, right? Everything hinges on fate sometimes. And I just kept thinking about that 17-year-old kid, that mother. And I knew, of course, what a lot of those emotions were that were going on. It's not a book to me about loss. It's actually a book about resilience. It's about the after effect. I mean, you never meet the child. What happens, happens right away. And you sort of, you get past that. And it's really about these two generations in a family. Um, it's about um, how you overcome things. It's about the fact that, and, and this is a big part of what I often talk to audiences about, we are built so much stronger than we think we are. Human beings are built to survive. And so the book explores that good part of us that is able to reach down and get through something, figure out how to love again. There are also two secrets in the book, and I think that's an interesting thing as well. At what point, when do you tell a secret to your loved one? Can you have a healthy relationship and just decide to squelch something? Um, and can you still move on and move forward? And, and you'll learn as the book goes on, is she complicit or not in what happened? Um, but to me, it's about people coming together. And I think we, we are all afraid of life. You can step out your front door and something could happen. And so I think the message is really to not be afraid. And in the horrible thing that happens that we will all experience a horrible thing, you will lose your parents. I will too. You will. You just have told me about supporting somebody in your town who's going through a hard time. Your wife will know somebody who has breast cancer and she'll take care of them. So we're all going to be exposed to that. And I think the message is really, we all survive that. And we survive it kind of by coming together and being together, especially a family. So writing as a mother um, about the death of a child, one of the most devastating things that a mother can imagine, that a father can imagine, had to be really difficult too as you went through the process because you begin to, it begins to come to life to you as you're writing it, obviously. You know, we have a really good, I have a very dear friend and the book is dedicated to her son and he died um, two years, a year ago, uh, from cancer at age five. So we were very close to him and visited him in Sloan Kettering. He had cancer and he battled it back for a number of years. So I did watch that process close up of the grief. And I understood what grief felt like just grieving a living person who was in a coma for 36 days. I mean, I didn't know how this was going to end up. So I could absolutely write from grief. But the grief of a child, I think any parent can imagine. You started this interview by telling me that that's your worst fear and you've we all think about it. The minute we have a kid, we've opened a vein. We have just like, go ahead, you know, cut me. Because we're so vulnerable. And I think it's our worst nightmare. But the thing that this book is here to tell you is that everyone can overcome your worst nightmare. It doesn't mean it's the same. It doesn't mean that you forget or you move on. But you're, you've got this incredible resilience in you that I hope you never have to tap into. But if you do, you'll be okay. I think. Um, Roger um, and Margaret kind of came out of where I am in my life, where now um, women my age, 50s, 40s, are parenting their parents. So my dad has um, Alzheimer's, and to me it was it's that slow slide in a relationship where the seesaw tips, and I wanted to examine that with a secret that Roger has and see the father-daughter relationship, but also that generation of 1950-something housewives who just bucked up, who did not, who, you know, pulled the linens over, looked the other way. I am fascinated by my mother's generation. They are all drinking it on Valium because they were never, you know, taught to express themselves. And I just think, I wanted Margaret to be that rigid 1950s housewife and see what would happen when a little ball of fire was hurled into her life too. I think it's more um, that everything new gets old because this couple comes to a place in their marriage where it has broken them down and they're at a, a, not a good place. And I think 
the message is that sometimes maybe it's worth toughing it out. And I can say this as a 52-year-old woman, seeing so many friends thinking that there's something better out there and blowing it up and circling back five years later and kind of going, I'm really sorry I did that because we had something and we could have repaired it. And I think the message is um, maybe what's new isn't always better. Maybe sometimes the most important things, the ones we love most, are right at home.